Uh, Heterodox Academy just released a report on that that maybe we can go into some detail yep. later on, debunking the idea that there isn't a problem where people can have freedom of expression. I think part of the problem, and, and I'd love to see chime in on this, is that people use the word diversity in the most trivial and superficial way. They're not talking about ideological diversity or intellectual diversity. And we know that the overwhelming majority of professors on college campuses, I happen to fall into this category, uh, self-identify as liberal. And so the problem with that is that we have created echo chambers where people are increasingly uncomfortable about voicing opinions that don't jive well and don't conform with established moral orthodoxy. Uh, if there's one report that I could suggest that you read, it would be the most recent uh, part one and part two from Heterodox Academy with, with Jonathan Haidt, because it's a great detail about the statistics and the self-identification of people who are conservative and liberal and all over the spectrum about their experiences uh, on invoicing their uh, opinion on college campuses. And I'll just add one thing about the study. Uh, there have been actually three pretty good studies about free speech on campus. One of the best was carried out by the uh, Gallup Knight Foundation. They looked at 3,000 current college students. And they did it in 2016 and 2017. Now the good news is that about 70% of students said that they preferred a school that was a free and open environment. But uh, close to 30% preferred a positive environment where there would be censorship. Uh, the bad news here is that that's up to close to 30%. In one year, a year ago, it was 22 percent. Now that could just be a statistical glitch, and you know we'll see. But it's not going in the right direction. What worried me is that today, according to this poll and the one that carried out from the Cato Institute, similar findings: a, a, a large percentage of American students, 37 percent, think that it's acceptable to shut down speakers. And uh, uh, now the question is, would this be a view of the general population? Uh, you know, we, to know if we have, how serious the problem is, you want to find out if the general population thinks that way. I know if they ask people about it, if they think hate speech is illegal, most people think it is. So we want to see, is something bad going on the campus? Is it worse? Is it intensifying? And what I've argued is what's intensifying is that it's bolstered by this philosophy that speech is violence. And that could be, you know, explaining the. And, and you were accused of that at Oberlin of discursive violence. Yes, of discursive violence, uh, and uh, called a fascist and so forth for moderate views, in my view. <laughs> yeah, and I think I would add to that that, uh, and I think there is reason beyond the statistics. I think there are a number of psychological trends that are worth noting that. I think will ultimately make the problem worse in the long run. And um, just briefly say that it all seems to be wrapped around this emotional safety culture idea that there's um, uh, administrators feel like they need to protect the emotional safety of students. Um, but in addition to that, a lot of students are worried about, um, and to some extent, in, in, a, in a good way, are worried about hurting other people's feelings, but they're also extremely worried about being ostracized themselves, and, um, or being, you know, being labeled, uh, you know, some kind of bigot or, or racist or sexist or something like that. So there seems to be a whole bunch of different parameters working in concert to, you know, to sort of um, throttle back um, people's feelings about free speech. I think. And one thing I should add is there's a big difference between men and women. Is that men? Uh, are much less likely to say that they want a, a campus where they're protected from freedom. And it's a high percentage of women, women are kind of driving a lot of these trends. So there's a big gender gap. Uh, men tend to favor freedom and in the right to offend, and women are seeking more protective environment. I consider equal, we can handle debate, we can handle courts of law, you know, this idea that just to give an example at Brown University, they brought in two feminist speakers. Uh, one denied that campus was a rape culture. 
uh, Wendy McElroy, a libertarian feminist, and they brought her into debate. Uh, Jessica Valenti, you know, this major, a major feminist who did, did very much believe these statistics that suggest an epidemic of predation on campus. The Brown students organized a safe room under the auspices of the, of the president. And in this safe room, they had a rolling, you know, tapes of frolicking puppy dogs and bubbles and Play-Doh, and it was so infantilizing. And to me, I just thought, this is what feminism has come to, and they can't face a debate. And this was written about by uh, Judith, Judith Schulwitz in the New York Times, this safe, you know, this trigger culture. It's not on all campuses, but Brown University, I mean, be careful of that school, it's gotten too far, certainly Oberlin, possibly Swarthmore, Wells. Roaming the end, just pick up on something. So we did a, uh, an event at Portland State University with James Moore. And it was originally a fireside chat with myself and James Moore. And with the help of Andy, we invited the Women's Studies Department, the five-person Women's Studies Department, to sit on stage. Now keep in mind, I'm not a gender studies expert. We would have loved for the Women's Studies Department to join us online. They did not join us online, so we, ex we expanded the panel. The next day, uh, James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose and I are two days later, I think February 19th, again, invited the Women's Studies Department to come up as equals on stage with us, uh, and they did not. And then I was advised that if I were to do that again, to invite them to a, uh, not a debate, and we were very specific, and very specific in any other, a conversation that we invited them to have with us about gender equity and uh, the DeMore memo. And I was told in no uncertain terms that if I did that again, that would be chronic, persistent harassment that could fall into Title IX violations. So now even challenging my colleagues or, or inviting them to a conversation is uh, a form of, of sexual harassment. Now, just, just as one quick parenthetical, could you imagine if I did that to the physics department? Could, could you imagine if I invited the physics? It would be, inc first of all, they would laugh at me, but second of all, it would be utterly inconceivable that they would say that I was harassing them. Of course, they, they'd love to come up and debate whether or not physics is a legitimate academic study. But, but that just goes to show how the institutional mechanisms are used for discursive violence when someone wants to have an argument or a debate, which is exactly what college campuses should be. They're then told it's a form of aggression and violence, and they need to stop this because it's a form of harassment. And I think that's an interesting point to bring up. So in this case, you have you know fellow academics, colleagues, kind of almost trying to shut down the debate. And as you mentioned, uh, I think the formality of people who are involved in universities, as either professors or administrators, uh, they do lean liberal or, or to the left. But as Dr. Summers mentioned, you also have a number of students themselves saying that they would prefer a place that is not just free, but actually positive. So in your opinion, do, do you think that the push we see currently for speech codes on campuses, do you see that as something that has been pushed onto students by professors and administration, or do you think that it's something that has evolved naturally and organically among the student population? In your opinion, where is where's this push coming from? Is it is it student-led, professor-led, or is it sort of both parties agreeing, sounds like, yeah, this is a good idea, let's just try to limit the, the hate speech going on? Well, I would say that uh, a lot of I think that being in favor of free speech is not an idea that comes easily to a lot of people. A lot, I think censorship is a stronger instinct. There was a great uh, a reporter at the LA Times who uh, long since passed away, but he once said, uh, censorship is the deepest you know, urge in, in human nature, sex being you know, a distinct second, that people really <laughs> like to censor. So I think a lot of kids just think, well, yeah, you know, people should be nice. And what they have to learn is the battle for free speech. Where did it start? Why did it, you know, make its way into the Bill of Rights? What is that history? And what they would learn is that setting up a censorship regime, uh, installing a group of people who get to decide what you can say and what you can think and what you can read um, is just, not worth it because it never works. It's just better to 
they, you know, as I said, err on the side of freedom, just let people free. And then you, it's not, now that's not to say we're gonna have a society that's where everyone's uh, vulgar and, and horrible to each other. All three parties are partially to blame. And what I mean by three, there's administrators, there's faculty, and there's students. And they all have competing interests in some ways. In some ways, they have shared interests. But there's some evidence in my field of psychology, for instance, um, in support of the slower life development theory that students are taking, you know, young people are taking longer to, to mature along the line. And this is a function of prosperity and having smaller families. This is one of the, you know, if you just have one or two kids and you're middle class, upper middle class, you can give them more attention and protect them more. And, you know, they don't get beat around as much when they're growing up. So, they get to college and they've been relatively sheltered. Um, and there's a you know there's a whole bunch of behavioral data to support that too, besides just like besides like self-report. There's you know, young people are less likely to drive, they're you know, they're waiting long to have sex, they're not doing drugs. Some of these are you know socially positive trends. But so they're getting to college less prepared to grapple with ideas, perhaps, is one possibility. Um, administrators are increasingly business-minded um, bureaucrats who want students to be happy. And so the happiness doesn't just come from lazy rivers and nice dorms, though that too. But they don't want anyone to be upset. So there's a customer-based model that seems to be increasingly um, the case on, on campuses, um, which is not a good model of education. Right? Um, and then there is, as you know, Christina talked about earlier, there is a small percentage of faculty. Most of the faculty lean left, but there's a small percent that are ideologically motivated and they take advantage either on purpose or just by incident, take advantage of this, you know, of these, um, of these properties of the college campus to control sort of what is good and bad speech. So, if you're a hardcore Marxist professor and you want to tell everyone that um, we live in a culture of white supremacy or a matrix of oppression, um, interestingly, no one's saying those words are violence. Right? Um, the, the, it's an ace, the words of violence is asymmetrical, right? There's only certain types of words, um, even if they're the same, even if you know they have the same kind of dimensions of being mean or hostile or whatever. There's only certain types of ideologies where words of violence. So I think those faculty kind of get to take advantage of that as well. Yeah, I, I'd like to add to that. Uh, I would say that to answer your question, there is a very strong opinion about this. There is a direct cause of all of the madness that you see now happening on campus. Direct. You can trace out, I'm writing an article about this right now, you can literally trace out disinvitations, you, anything, any subject area that's been infected by postmodernism in general and gender studies in particular is the nucleus, it is the epicenter of the madness. And I'll give you a few examples. I highly recommend John Hanash's book, Kindly Inquisitors, particularly chapter eight answers that question. It's truly one of the most important books I've read maybe even ever, but certainly in the last decade, kindly inquisitors. The second thing is DePaul University in uh, Indiana, recently uh, there was some racist graffiti was found in the bathroom. I don't know if anyone's familiar with this, this just happened. And they made the faculty and students read this article uh, about white fragility by someone named Robin D'Angelo. So there's, there are lines of literature that trace back. Christy Dodson, Alison Bailey, I'm just gonna push back. There's a philosopher in the UK called Miranda Fricker who wrote, writes about testimonial injustice. The fact of the matter is that there is some legitimacy in, in all of this stuff, but if you want to understand why this is happening, why there's an assault on free speech, it goes back to discursive violence, words are violence, it goes back to privilege. It also goes back to what Christina talked about in her talk about how we need to look at these movements, particularly intersectional movements, as, as nascent religious movements. And we see fundamentalists' inability to change your mind, inability to look at other points of view, inability to uh, give ideas, certain ideas, countenance, you're judged by your gender, by your race, by exogenous characteristics of which you have no ability whatsoever to control. So my, I think 
there is, the pushback is coming from multiple sources from the administration who just wants things tranquilo, but if you want to know the source of the madness, it is one single nucleation point, and it is gender studies. Well, I think so far we've heard quite a compelling uh, argument for free speech and its importance in, in universities, but I want to take some time now to address reasons why some people might be in favor of things like speech codes. And I would like to know what you guys all think of the idea that um, safety, the safety of students is the responsibility of universities and that universities have a responsibility to protect students from things like microaggressions or hurtful ideas because they're they're young. Uh, universities are sort of the first taste of adulthood and independence that a lot of these students are, are experiencing without uh, living in the parents' house or without the, I guess, almost privilege of, of being young enough where you don't have to actually take these ideas and live them out in the real world. So what would your responses be to that? Well, I think that some of it, a lot of it, is well-intended. And I want people to be courteous and kind to each other and have spent a good deal of my professional life just in philosophy, favoring uh, his humanitarian movements and animal rights movements and you know just anything to have more uh, kindness and less suffering. I am not, I, so they're convinced that by having speech codes you prevent suffering. And my answer to that is that uh, by, I don't think they work. I, I think, uh, and they are also likely to be abused and and to uh, be used to uh, just shut down ideas that people don't like, and that's that's happening. I just think there are tried and true methods. One is education. As people get more educated, they tend to be less uh, intolerant and bigoted. That was once the case, and I hope it's still continuing to be the case. But education is one. And then to break down bigotry, the best formula we know is intimacy and friendship and getting to know people that are very different from you. Because all of us, when we first meet each other, we're you know, just, just stereotypes, whatever you are. But that, as you know, that break, when you become friends with somebody, you don't see race, color, gender, so much. You just you see their individuality. And I, I, I was at a campus speaking I think it was Boston College and the Young Americans Foundation. It's kind of a conservative student group that invited me. And these two Young Americans guys came up, and one, they had been assigned as, as roommates. And one was a, he had started out, he was a gay guy uh, and very left wing. And his roommate was a big kind of football player from the South who was homophobic and a Republican. So you got a homophobic Republican and a left wing gay guy and their roommates. But, you know, those were the labels. They were just people. They became friends. They became best friends. And now the uh, gay guy is a Republican. This is to do it with humor, to do it with friendship. To do it. Now, I know sometimes you've got to change the laws and you've got to have an aggressive campaign in every the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, the gay rights movement. We've had that. But we've, we've crossed a lot of those barriers. And now it's a matter of building a, a, a tolerant community you bring in rigid codes, and all it does is drive it underground. And I think that's what's happening in the, you know, uh, on the internet. You know, where people will go and and be extremely uh, say a lot of bigoted things and carry on. And it was it was driven there. And you know, I'd really rather have people tell you know their ideas out there to be challenged if they're. Uh, terrible ideas, dangerous ideas, anti-Semitic, racist, so forth. They should be, that's how it works. So long-winded answer, I, my, I, if I thought that worked, it was gonna make us a kinder, nicer, better society, I think it's making us angry and it's dividing us and it's creating uh, mutually hostile little tribes on the campus. So I'm very worried that what's happened on the campus is now going to be taken into the workplace, and I think it's already happened in Silicon Valley. Yeah, I think all that's definitely true. And one thing I, I would say is I think this is a false, you know, this argument that safety versus freedom is, is kind of odd in some ways because college campuses are about the safest place to explore ideas that one can imagine. So I, I think of an example, like, because I have 
kids and I remember taking them to swim lessons and teaching them to swim. I think it's actually dangerous for colleges to not prepare students to confront ideas, right? It's not providing them safe space. It's, it's like saying, here we have a place where you're gonna have a swim instructor that's gonna make sure you're safe while you're learning. So nothing's gonna to happen to you. If you get to practice, you'll, you know, you'll get scared, you'll sink, they'll lift you up. But it's a space where you learn to swim. That's the way it should be. But the, that, the, the safety approach that, that some seem to want to support is more like, well, no one gets to get in the pool because something bad could happen. But guess what? In real life, you're going to end up confronting water at some point, and then you're going to drown <laughs> because no one taught you to swim. So it's, it seems dangerous not to prepare people um, for the world that exists. And so in some ways, colleges are passing the buck, right? They're saying, we just want to keep things quiet. We don't want anyone to deal with anything. We want everything tame, and then you can go out in the world, and you're, you know, that's your problem. Well, I think um, what Can I just jump in a little bit? You do not have a right to be protected from ideas in a college context. That's total fucking bullshit. And any administrator, any administrator who propagates that idea, I don't know what, they shouldn't be an administrator. Your swimming example is fantastic because t teaching people to be protected from swimming does not make them better swimmers. That makes them more apt to drown. And the total number of ideas that we could take in is infinite. And we need to give people tools, not to teach them to suspend judgment, but to teach them how to make better, more discerning judgments, particularly in the moral sphere. And we're not doing that, and we're failing kids. And the idea that we can revert to safety, you, that does not make you safe. You are not safe. And it's, what's particularly interesting is, not only does it not make you safe, it makes you brittle. And that's why the question was so the question was so interesting because we are now encountering people who cannot make arguments. So it's incumbent upon us to make a better argument than they could be for why there shouldn't be free speech on college campuses. When you consistently do not hear the other side of a story long enough, not only will you become brittle, but you will become increasingly convinced that what you believe is true. And instead of being able to come up with a well-reasoned position for it, you have to make up the slack. You have to be offended. You have to be outraged. You have to smear people with a racist or sexist or bigot. You know what? That's run dry. I'm not having it anymore. It's bullshit. So the idea that we protect people, that we should somehow institutionalize the idea that people should be protected, students should be protected from the ideas. We need to give that a swift kick in the face and an early death. Well, let me give you just one example to uh, uh, support what you said. Uh, I, I went so, it's somewhere on YouTube, I saw a panel discussion about uh, whether or not campuses should have trigger warnings and safe spaces. And there was a, there was a, there were two young women who very much believed in these, and they were trying to explain why. And then there were two women, uh, Miriam Namazi and Sarah Haider, who are uh, Muslim atheists. They are Muslim atheists. And uh, the world is not a safe space for them. It's very unsafe and they give threats. But when they appear on campuses, sometimes the um, sort of intersectional alliance includes uh, Muslim students who consider it harassment to have people like Muslim atheists come on campus. They call it Islamophobia because these Muslim atheists feel oppressed by their religion. And so they come and say, why we, you know, we want to have a more, a stronger, an atheist movement within, you know, on the American campus. So what, what do you do if you're an administrator? Who, which group, so they end up having to take sides. And so it becomes very safe for one group of students and then for Miriam Namazi and Sarah Hayter, very unsafe for them. And so it, that, that's, it's just unworkable. And there's a reason why we can know who is the most depressed. We, we, we know from intersectional theory, you mentioned Crenshaw, we know why Black Lives Matter can interrupt the pride parades in Seattle. We know why Sarah Hayter gets and Mary Namazi get the bad end of that stick because they don't possess the most depression variables. And whoever possesses the most depression variables has the right to speak. 
And for that, we need to talk a little bit about standpoint theory, which would take us a little far adrift, but I recommend there's some wonderful pieces about standpoint theory out there. But the, interse the intersectional alliance and the oppression variables, again, about which you spoke, this is a very clear way to understand the thinking of these folks. You possess the most oppression variables, you have the most right to speak and interrupt the speech of others. That's the matrix by which they make those judgments about speech and speech codes. Well, I mean, as the uh, you know biracial woman on the panel, if I, if I can interject for a second, um, two oppression examples. I've got I've got the age thing going here. Maybe we can all tally after. Yeah, let's just let's give our oppression identities, and then we'll make a, a matrix of oppression right here. Oh, um, so I think the, when we're ever talking about free speech on campus, usually the, the way that this comes up is that someone like you know yourselves who, who have experienced a little bit of pushback for your ideas on campus or speakers like uh, Ben Shapiro, that all the protests they encounter, it, it's usually brought up as a, can you believe that free speech is being assaulted when these are the people, they're actually reasonable, but they're being called extremists, right? That's kind of usually how this is portrayed in, in the media or, or during our conversations about this. I wanted to make things a little bit more difficult for all of us. And let's talk about actual extreme ideas, not just the, the what the, I guess, um, I don't know, gender studies department would qualify as extreme ideas. Let's say that there is perhaps a KKK group operating on one campus or an alt-right group, right? I mean, they're small, but they are real groups that people that are out there that really do believe things like, say, the white race is superior, that America should be resegregated, or perhaps even broken up into different countries based on race. Should these groups be allowed to advocate for their causes and attempt to recruit on campuses? Should these ideas, should they be able to raise these their opinions in the context of a classroom debate? As people who, who interact with students, how would how would you manage that? Are there oh, any guidelines? Yeah. Well, the, the thing is, uh, you don't have to offer courses uh, where those views are represented because in a typical course. What you'll do is represent uh, the range of, uh, you know, respected opinion among scholars, and that that could include conservatives and progressives. And the, but typically, you know, if you have a Holocaust denier, it, there's not, it doesn't, it's, there's no reason to offer a class on that or witchcraft or I don't know something that's not taken seriously. But student groups, <coughs> this is the other thing. Students, if they want to organize groups, I would not join such a group or want, you know, a, a Richard Spencer to come to campus, but if they want him, and it's a public university, private universities is different, but if it's a public university, it's Berkeley, it's America. You can be, you know, a right wing nut in America, and uh, you're not going to get very far typically because you just don't have very good arguments. And so the best thing to do when these people come is ignore them. And it used to be, they, I, when I was in college, I was, I forget what his name, he was the head of the American Nazi Party, and he'd go, I would live near UCLA, and, I, and he'd go, you know, 21 people, 24 people would go and listen, and it, was, it, nobody occur, it didn't occur to anybody to ban, because we don't do that here. Yeah, and in addition to that, I think you also, what you would notice is how quickly we re reveal how fringe and pathetic a lot of these groups are, because, you know, if you have a little bit of faith in humanity, most, you know, I've been working on college campuses for 15 some years, and most of the students are kind-hearted, good people that are trying to learn and figure things out, explore different ideas, you know, as Christina was mentioning earlier, um, trying on different theories. Um, there's gonna be a few fringe bad apples, and there's gonna be people that aren't, that are just bad, and it has nothing to do with an ideology, right? They just, it's their personality. And always trying to control that or regulate that in some way just pushes it somewhere else. And it's better just to let it, you know, just to let it be revealed and let people kind of organically, people will push back. Like if you, this happened not on my campus, but there was a, um, at another North Dakota campus, there was a um, um, kind of like, a, I think it was just like a joke thing, but there was, uh, you know, somebody made some kind of racist joke and, or put a picture on the internet or something like that. Can't remember the details, but it got immediate swift public um, pushback, right? And they didn't need to. And the president of the university 
said they, the students, won't be punished. They're within their rights to do what they want, and everyone else is within their rights to, to, to call them out on it. And I think it was, for most people, I think that's a life lesson. People do dumb things sometimes. I think a lot of those young students didn't really think it through, but then they found out how much it hurt people's feelings, how upsetting it was, and most normal, morally conscious human beings will be like, oh, I didn't intend to do that. And so if we have a little bit more faith in humanity, um, I think a lot of these things would self-regulate. Yeah, the point to be taken there was that they attacked an immutable characteristic of a person like skin color as opposed to an idea, which was your former question. So if you don't know who Daryl Davis is, you should. Daryl Davis is a black man who goes around and talks to and befriends people from the Ku Klux Klan. This man is a hero. This man has a closet of abnegated hoods from Klansmen who have given up these insane beliefs, racist, grotesque beliefs. We know the literature is crystal clear. And the literature is people change their beliefs from a point of view of safety, like Christina said, Clay alluded to, People change their views because they know acceptance of homosexuality would be a great example of that. If Daryl Davis, can, a black man, can go around and help talk, befriend Ku Klux Klan members and talk them out of Ku Klux Klan, our students should be able to talk about factory farming or talk about border walls or guns in school or whatever issue is coming up. Not from the point of view of psychological safety. Why does everybody know who Richard, who Richard Spencer is? Nobody should know who Richard Spencer is. Well, they know who he is because he was punched in the face. So the person who punched him in the face made Richard Spencer. Don't make people like that. People like that are best ignored. And the moment you start banning certain views, sunlight is the best disinfectant. The moment you start banning that, that's when your problems begin, 100% of the time. So you want to have a question? Daryl Davis. That, that's a wonderful point. And actually, um, if you guys haven't heard of him, there have been a number of news stories about him. I think he really is quite, quite an amazing figure. And I think on that note, we're going to transfer over to the Q&A segment. So we actually, we're going to have people come and... When they recognize certain problems that adults have to deal with day to day, they start to have priorities. So what do you think would be a good way for schools to kind of give them a more accurate representation of adulthood? Well, one thing I'd start with, um, before even getting into that, is it's just good to remember, because we, we talk about these instances on campus, um, but the majority of college students in the U.S. are not, are not these um, full-time residential students at elite universities. Um, the majority of college students are going to school part-time and working. They're going to community colleges, they're going to their local college, and they have a family or other things going on. So there's a, there's a whole segment of the college population that does not have time for any of these games. <laughs> they're just going to school and they have things going on. So, you know, getting to your, getting to your point, I mean, that's, there, you know, well, I'll just say for, for example, at my institution, which is a residential college, the first year students are required to live on campus unless they're a certain age. I can't remember, like 26 or 20, I can't remember what it is. Or unless they're living with their parents within a 30 mile radius. Everyone else who comes there has to live on campus their first year in the dorms. And there's good evidence that that's, that's a pretty good idea actually for retention and, and good grades. Um, so, though, so that's you know the stereotypical college student in, in that experience. Um, yeah, I think there's, I, and I think you know the, the point I was making a little bit earlier. I mean, I think it's the case that it's, it's increasingly the case, and we hear the word privilege a lot. But this is the privilege of a of a wealthy society. Is a lot. There are a fair amount of students that you know haven't worked. They don't um, or haven't worked for you know for, for money. Um, they just going from high school to the parents are sending them. To, to college, um, and so I, this is an issue that universities are, 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 are grappling with. It's in a way, and I, I, I'd be curious to what Peter's thoughts on this, because I've noticed in my, just in the last few years myself, there's been kind of this effort at the sort of administrative level to make college a little bit more like high school, 
and as far so like make us go to trainings where we're supposed to give students more people so we're supposed to give them like grade updates and, and things like that and they're putting in these you know thanks to of course to computer programs you can do all these things where students get automatic warnings in my son's high school um you want to talk about not having to have responsibility he gets text alerts from his teachers reminding him that he has a test the next day or something's due the next day um, you know, so the more these things are mediated by, by computers and by programs that can automatically remind people to do things, they're going actually the opposite direction of what you're suggesting, which is teaching them adult responsibility. That there's not, not going to be anyone to tell you you're supposed to do this tomorrow, you're supposed to have this project done. And you know, I, I, I don't really know, but um, I do think it's worth em emphasizing that there are a lot of students that. Um, that that's not their experience. They, you know, they have to they have to work hard. They work jobs out, you know, out, off campus, and they've got other things going on. Um, so I think it's worth remembering that. Let's just see if we can crank out some more questions. the alt-right as extreme. As far as I've observed, the alt-right seem to merely advocate that the majority demographic of a nation should sustain its sovereignty. It seems that every nation kind of wants that, at least for themselves. Uh, why is it only that in white countries that to establish the sovereignty of the majority demographic is considered either intolerant or perhaps maybe even um, extreme or dangerous. And the second question is, um, how do we fight intolerant ideas with tolerance? Haven't we given feminist ideas, socialist, Marxist ideas, uh, enough tolerance to the point where they now control academia, to the point where they now establish the quote unquote truth? How do we fight intolerance without ourselves being intolerant? to uh, intolerant ideas. How can a, a group of people with fundamentally differentiating and opposing and violently, extremely opposite ideas um, remain tolerant to something that is fundamentally different from it, fundamentally opposed to it by every means of its aspect? Okay, all right, so that's enough, that's enough. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, I'll just tell you about the tolerance. And yeah, what do you do when you are a tolerant society, tolerant university, and then you have a group of people that are against it? Do you tolerate it? We do. But the way to defeat it is to show that they are wrong. Now, I know in, I, I wouldn't agree that, I am not yet to the point where I'm throwing up my hands and thinking that the forces of uh, uh, repression have won in our universities. I think it's an ongoing battle and, uh, there are sometimes surprising reversals. And just as you think, it couldn't get worse, it gets better. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm, so I'm not giving up. I think in a way the millennial generation hasn't yet found its voice. Every generation of Americans has faced challenges to basic freedoms and a great temptation to give them up. And then somehow they come back. I believe that is still going to happen. So it's that the way to deal with it isn't to, you can't censor them, we have to reason with them. So, tolerance, yeah. sorry. Go ahead, no, yeah, tolerance or intolerance is totally irrelevant. What's relevant, I give you, for example, I give you the case of Bruce Gilling. Are you familiar with Bruce Gilling? Oh, Bruce, yeah. Yeah. Bruce Gilling published a piece, and so the core of the realm in the game, in the space that we're in, in academia, is that you publish. And when you publish, that means it doesn't mean that you write on a blog. It means that you publish a peer-reviewed piece of scholarship that your peers judge to be acceptable and worthy of entering the canon of knowledge. So Bruce Gilley published a piece in defense of colonialism and people went crazy. Like they went absolutely, they were demanding his PhD from Princeton, they wanted him to lose his job, they wanted him to lose his tenure. The, the, the editor of the journal was sentenced with death threats. I think the rubric, looking at it from the lens of tolerance or toleration, and those are different, 
is not the right lens to look at the problem. We have peer-reviewed journals. Clay is astonishingly well published. He's played the game. We've all played the game. Whether or not someone agrees or just if, if you don't like the art, if you don't like Bruce Kelly's article in defending colonialism, well, that's just too bad. Publish an article against it. That's the coin of the realm. The coin of the realm is not. I stand up and I freak out and I, I become enraged that people can't speak and I demand the person's PhD. But by analog, the same thing operates with institutions. The universities, it's not their role. If the, I, my, my atheist pedigree is absolutely impeccable. If the creationist wanted to come in sponsored by a Christian group and argue that the world is 6,000 years old, whatever crazy idea they have, they have every right to do so. It's not a question of tolerance. The university has to be neutral in those matters to allow unfettered discourse so that student groups can bring in and we can have those kind of academic discussions. So I would suggest that that's the wrong lens by which we should be looking at the problem. Mm -hmm. And did any of you guys want to field the question on the all right? I don't, I'm not qualified to talk about that. I don't know. Right, well, I, I think that was sort of directed at me because I think I'm the one who mentioned uh, them in relations, relationship to extremism. Um, the idea that they're extreme because they simply want the majority to have sovereignty is, I think, inaccurate, right? I, I would say everyone wants sovereignty of, of all groups, but what makes the alt right, I think, extreme, in my opinion, is not that they simply want the majority to have sovereignty is that they have a very different idea of what sovereignty and how it should be exercised than the actual majority does, right? I mean, it, you're kind of, I think, seeing things through the lens of white people like the alt-right want the ethnostate and racial segregation. That is not what the majority wants, and I think the fact that uh, some alt-right members, it's a very large, I mean, very large diversity viewpoint within that small group, but uh, the idea that some of them would be uh, willing to separate people who don't want to be separated, that's what makes them extreme. tend to be, um, you know, searchers and more, you know, people have decided not to go into business or not to go into law, and they might be a little resentful of the people who earn more money who they went into other things. Uh, but, uh, and, but there's a second reason, I think, why we're, what we're seeing right now is that a lot of people went to graduate school uh, and, and, and during the Vietnam War, they went to college to get out of the draft. And uh, the, uh, the academy kind of became the center for the anti-war movement. And I think what you've seen happening on the left, the left in America used to be based on um, uh, the workplace and on and defending uh, the, you know, working people's rights. And the, the center of gravity moved to the academy. The academy is now centered for the left. And um, so it's a power base. So it's sort of, you know, again, it's sort of selecting one another and pushing more and more in that direction. But it started in the Vietnam era, where it had always been liberal, but it went pretty, a lot of people very much on the left, and uh, stayed in the universities. So the baby boomers who, who have tenure now, who are starting to retire, although they trained the next generation who were more radical than they were, because at least those baby boomers did have a normal, most of the you know, classical education before, but to get their PhD, but now I don't know what the latest generation of grad students learn. A lot of propaganda in the humanities, certainly. So anyway, it just became a center of power for, for the left. And uh, that happens in societies, you know, different groups have to find their, their place, except that this is where we're educating all of our kids. So it's going to turn the society in a strange direction and it's going down now to you know, high school and elementary school where the entire education establishment is sort of marked by these, this leftist turn. Yeah, definitely. And there is actual evidence of a full-on prejudice too. So 
that, that Christina's right. This is how th that was sort of established. That that core that it was, you know a lot of these fields were kind of left. This now, if you go into like engineering or agriculture or computer science, you can see more you know see more differences or just irrelevance because you know the work is so unrelated to to ideology. But in, political, or in social science and humanities, um, just very very few non leftists, and there is evidence. Um, from surveys that academic, in my field of psychology, for instance, that a decent percentage of, um, of respondents it openly admitted that they would be prejudiced against, uh, discriminate against a conservative applicant. So if you find a conservative in um, a field like mine, they are either doing work that has no relevance to these issues and so they can just keep quiet and no one knows that they're conservative, um, or or they're in one of the few places that have more, you know, conservatives than colleges. Um, or they're just, you know, it's off this net, they've just, they, they've endured and they're just so good on so many other qualities. Either they bring in great grants or they, you know, they're, they're just doing such good research that they can overcome that. But um, there is absolutely a very, very strong evidence that um, non-leftists receive a considerable amount of discrimination in the social sciences and humanities. Thank you. Hi. Um, well, I have a statement and a brief statement and then a question. Um, Raming Lonel, you said before that there are extremist groups that want segregation and you insinuated that they were on the right. But I think the extremist groups that want separation of races are actually on the left because I've seen them on videos. I've seen black students asking to have their safe spaces. I've seen it in Australia where I live, where indigenous people get their own separate rooms away from all the white people. So I really don't think that is a problem with the right. It is a problem with the left. Well, I think the idea here is that it's it, when it comes to racial tribalism, it's not necessarily a left versus right issue. <coughs> Absolutely, I think that a large part of the progressive movement that so often makes the news with regards to wanting segregated housing, they absolutely have this racial collectivism, racial identitarianism. Um, but that, that it also is happening on, on the right. It's not, I think, as much of an institutional problem as it is on the left, but it, it's absolutely there. And I think the idea with this uh, collectivism and this racial identitarianism, it, it's not something that is affected by right versus left politics, right? So it's an ideology that's kind of actually completely um, separate from that left versus right spectrum. And I think it more, it's more a question of maybe individualism versus collectivism or authoritarian versus libertarianism rather than just, uh, you know, I want small government, you want big government. But I mean, you make a great point that, yeah, it's not just one side you have to worry about when it comes to that stuff. It's actually both. And I think you're right, the left right now is the, the largest issue with that. Thank you. And secondly, my question was, I'm sorry, I'm not very good with names. I'm doing the right. Peter Clay Christina. You're Peter? I am. Yeah. <coughs> to Peter, um, you said before that you are a liberal. Um, so Classical liberal. So, yeah, that's what I want to clarify. So would you now uh, think of yourself as on the right side of the spectrum? Because classical liberals have sort of moved now to the right, where once, probably, you know, decades ago, it was on the left. Classical liberals only moved to the right because academia... Because you've got is, forced to it. Well, more or less, yeah. So Stephen Peter calls it the left pole. So when you're so far on the left, everybody else looks like they're on the right. Yeah. And I think Clay and I were just talking about this today. It's a very interesting position to be in because if you just had an itemized checklist of things and you just went down, you know, 20 years ago, I was the guy who parents would warn their, the conservative parents would warn their kids about, oh, this, you know, super liberal professor, pro gay marriage, pro death of dignity, pro legalization of marijuana. I mean, I just anti death penalty, like I just check off all the boxes. But, that's, that is not what we're seeing now in the academy for these radical positions that are coming out. I don't, I consider myself to be, I mean, I voted for Obama twice. I, I, have a, I, I can't stand Trump and I have a pathological hatred for Scott Pruitt. So, I mean, I don't consider the views that I hold by any stretch of the imagination to be conservative, yet I find consistently over and over again that I'm well, I met with the university, I probably shouldn't say this on film, but I met with someone from the university and he said to me, oh, I know you, you're the Breitbart guy. 
<laughs> it just blew my mind. I mean, it just totally blew me away. And so it really is a, a case in which everybody is swimming in a sea that's so far to the left that people who have classically liberal views are now considered to be on the right. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I write for National Review, so you can imagine the, uh, <laughs> the, the love I received <laughs> on campus. All right, guys, thank you. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Clay. Thank you, Peter. And thank you.